It's a message of love and a message of truth. And it's also, you may have heard during some of the songs, it's a message of triumph and victory. Um, so what this is here tonight, all right, you're going to hear my testimony, but what it primarily is, is a gospel meeting, right? And what gospel really means is good news. So what it is, it's good news from heaven, good news from God, that God needs you to know something if you are not saved. That God, that God wants you to know him and love him. It can start right here and last forever. So really tonight, I am going to, yes, speak about myself, but it's not really about me, right? It's about Jesus Christ. So you might hear me maybe talking about things in my life, but it's not to glorify me. It's to just communicate to you where I was and where the Lord saved me and brought me to. So that's really, I'm only using my past to magnify Christ. Okay, so if I start rambling about myself, please bear with me, right? Um, you're going to maybe hear tonight a challenging message because that's what the gospel does. It presents us with a challenge from God. But as the Bible says in, in uh, Proverbs 26, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. So the Lord Jesus Christ is a true friend. And a true friend will tell you the truth, even if it hurts you. But see, an enemy, an enemy will tell you what you want to hear all day long. So this is what this is tonight. It's about truth. And it's the truth of God. So I'm going to begin to start my, sort of tell you a bit about me and go into my testimony. But there's going to be maybe a bit into it that I am going to share a little portion of scripture that really hit me hard before I was saved. And it's a scripture that really challenged me. And I hope tonight that the Lord will use this scripture to challenge you. And this scripture will, chal will challenge, if you want to say, saint and unbeliever at the same time. It's a very challenging scripture, but that's what the word of God is here to do. For the believer, it's here to make you more like Christ. And we need challenge to be more like Christ. But for the unbeliever, right, this word, you need to know. Why? Because you need to be saved. You need to be right with God. And I hope that the reality of that comes out really it hits you like a bright light tonight. So, just to get underway, I'm from West Belfast. I'm from the Catholic community in West Belfast. I grew up uh, very two loving parents, um, Paul and Marie. I've got, I always have to think about this one, I've got three sisters and two brothers. I'm the oldest, and I grew up in a street called Springfield Park. Now, Springfield Park is on a peace lane, right? between Spring Martin, right? So you've, you've got that big wall in the middle. Some of here made a few stones at me. But I'm only joking. So, so th that's where I grew up. And I think at one point, and, and I think there was a stat, I'm nearly sure this is true, you heard it before, that it was the most shot into street in Northern Ireland at one stage, through the Troubles. So I grew up in that street. And again, even though I grew up and the Troubles were still very active, I can always thank my parents for this, that I was never brought up with any sectarian views. My father wouldn't even have had that talk in the home. And it, so me growing up, maybe you'd say a real peace lane where there was trouble. I grew up as a child, never ever had a bad view against a Protestant. Now, um, I can really thank my mother and father for that. Um, but another thing too, my grandfather's a Protestant from the Shankill Road and he's a Linfield man. So sometimes people, old friends, would have called me a crossbreed. So they would have, because the townies I come from are actually from, is it Canmore Street? That's where it is. Yes, that's where my granddad and all grew up. So, um, so really, I grew up in Springfield Park. I was just a normal kid. I loved to play football. Football from an early age. I was one of those kids who was breaking windows and damaging their cars, because getting chased all the time, because I loved to play football. And, and I was brought up, 
as a, as a, as a Catholic, and the schooling system is where I learned about my Catholic faith then, my Catholic belief. But I grew up as a child believing that, as you do as a child, this is the way to God. I believe the way the Catholic uh, Church taught you about Jesus, that is the way. And there's an old saying in the Catholic Church that came from the Jesuit priests. They said, give us the boy till he's seven and we will show you the man. Now, when I was young, it was constantly every day drummed into you with the Catholic teaching. Now, I know the Catholic schooling system has changed dramatically from that now. But, so I grew up, I did believe in God. I believed the Catholic way to God. I also, I prayed to Jesus, but I did pray to Mary. I prayed to dead relatives because that's what I was taught. Um, but my parents were not kind of, if you want to say, very religious. So the, where I would have been more influenced in the Catholic way would have been the schooling system. But again, back to the football, love playing football. Maybe got to a certain age where I started realizing I was good at football. So I developed a little dream as every boy does. I want to go and play for Man United. And only Man United. Not Chelsea, not Liverpool. Only Man United. Right? So, so, I, so that was me. You're a kid, you're playing football every day, and you're going, right, I want to play for Man United. And uh, so I, I got to a certain age. Folks, I want to say this before I go on, because I have forgot to say this before, and I, I, can, I come under flag. I have a wife called Shannon. <laughs> right? We have two young boys, Caleb and Joshua. And Shannon got saved two years after me. I'm seven and a half years saved, and Shannon came two years after me. I'm of two lovely boys, and it's such a, it's such, it's so lovely now when you, you're both, one is seven, one is two, and when they start to talk to you about Jesus, it's really encouraging, so praise God for that. But, so here we go with this dream about football. So I got to a certain age, I started doing well again in the Milk Cup teams, and I started going across the England for trials. And I remember I came back from a club in England and I didn't want to go back ever again because I got very homesick. I remember when I came home, I was only 16, well, 17 at the time. I thought I didn't want to go back to England. You're go, going away at 16, you're a young boy, you're put in a strange home with people you don't know. And then a lot of, and this is no disrespect, I'm not generalizing English people, but when you go over there as a young boy from Northern Ireland, not all the English people take you very well. They don't, a lot don't like you. And maybe because you're there to take their place, so they don't like it. So I didn't have a real good time, and when I came back, my whole dream of football was like, gone. I remember getting a job in Lifestyle Sports over in the park centre. It says, I'll just work and just enjoy my weekends. But then there was an Irish League club after maybe a few months phoned me up, and it was Cliftonville. Cliftonville phoned me up and says, look, Connor, would you like to, would you come up to training with us and see if you can maybe get the bug back for the game. So I decided to go to Cliftonville, and I really hit the ground running. Within, within the year, I was playing in the first team. And again, dreams started coming back on again. Started like, right, okay, maybe I'm getting a bit older now, maybe, maybe I could do England now. So again, I went back over to Burnley in England, and the, and the player was playing for them then was Paul Gascoigne. Gazza was there. And I'd done really well, and I came back, and they wanted me to go back for seven, I came back here for the, the, the off-season. They wanted me to go back for seven weeks pre-season. But at that time, I decided to go to America instead. I had an opportunity in America. Cut a long story short, there was a lot of things over there that didn't work out right behind the scenes, not football. I ended up home. So when I came back home again, again, continued to play football, and this is where things began to kind of turn I, was, I signed for Clevenville again. This time, I was about 23. And I can remember I heard we were signing a born-again Christian. Now, this Clevenville changing room is the craziest football changing room I've ever been in. Right? Mad men in it. And I remember thinking, a born-again Christian coming in here? He'll get eight alive in here. Now, at this stage, I had left all my Catholic teachings behind. I had become kind of atheist, agnostic, kind of, if you said you believed in God, I'd have said you're a header. No such thing. But then in my quiet time, I would have been going, I don't really know. So it was kind of, 
in the middle. But I remember Nathan came and he signed and he came into our changing room. He didn't speak like us. He didn't conduct themselves like, like us. He didn't drink. He didn't smoke. He didn't, he didn't curse. I remember thinking, he's not real. That's not real. This guy's a phony. There's no way that's real. Like, it's not normal. But as time went on, I became more interested in him. But what I wanted to do was seriously challenge him. So I started attacking Nathan to make him look stupid. And I started kind of giving him the most difficult questions. Now, Nathan's father is a minister, and I remember he always used to say to me many times, Can I don't know that one, but I lost my daddy. But there was one night he came in, a Thursday night training, and I thank God that he did this. He came in on a Thursday night training with an NIV New Testament Bible. And he says, Connor, put that in your bag. And I looked at him, and I, I was part of the kind of crazy gang in the changing room. So I looked at him and went, what are you giving me out for, Nathan? I was kind of like, didn't want people to see him giving me a Bible. It was like a sign of weakness. But he says, Connor, please just put it in your bag. So I put it in my bag. I remember taking it home that night and actually going... Don't, don't even know what that means. Threw it on top of the wardrobe. And that was that. Continued to maybe try to have goals at Nathan. But I ended up signing for Linfield. And I left Clivenville. I was only meant to sign for Linfield for... I was only meant to be at, at, at the Blues for three months. Because Oldham had came to watch me about 15 times in the Irish League at Clivenville. They wanted me over in trial, but I wouldn't go at 24 years of age. I said, I'm too old for trials. So I said to Olam, if you like me, you give me a contract. Because I had good contracts waiting back here. As me, I'm not going to a League One club in England on a trial. So they come back and they says, right. Basically, the next club I was going to, right, that I, had, I was going to get them a contract that they, didn't, they couldn't ask for money for me. So when I spoke to David Jeffries, who was then the Linfield manager, I, said, I stipulated that to him. I says, Davey, I'm only looking to be here for about three months and I'll be gone if all goes well. Linfield agreed to that. So my dream is back on. I'm 24 years of age. I'm a lot more wiser. I'm a lot more mature. And I'm saying, right, I'm ready to take, take this, as the saying goes, the bull by the horns. So I started to play for Linfield in my fifth game for Linfield. I jumped against Glenn Torn in the Satanta Cup. I jumped up for the ball, landed, and snapped my whole knee. And I knew right away, right, that's old and gone. Once I heard, I got very quick news because we had a specialist at, at, at Linfield. And he says, Connor, your cruciate's gone. So that was going to be a year before I got back playing. You're talking, it could be another good load of months after that before you're even back in here, what you could play like. So I says, old has gone, that's the dream gone. Now, I'm going to tell you what I believe, looking back, what was happening there. Football was an idol of mine. Football was my God. I loved it when I used to go back to bars after a match on a Saturday, and people used to give me praise. Oh, Connor, I've seen your name in the paper today. I've seen the highlights today. Great goal you scored. You're flying, and I loved all that. So I can remember if we didn't win on a Saturday, seeing a Monday or Tuesday night football training, I would have been kicking the life out of my teammates. You know what it was all down to? Because Connor didn't get his praise. I didn't get my ego tickled. So football was becoming my identity. And I loved it. It was my God. It was the treasure of my heart. But then something happened. When my knee snapped, I got very down. And guess what I started thinking about? The deeper thoughts that we all get. And I know everybody here has had them. If you're here and you're not saved, I know you've had deep thoughts. Why am I here? What is the reason for life? Why do I exist? What's it all about? Paying bills and then dying? So if a child is born in, say, in Africa, 
has to go through life scrapping for food. That's just tough luck, kid. Tough luck for you. That's hopelessness. I mean, there's got to be more. So that led me on to the thoughts, I wonder, is there a God? I wonder, is it all real? Do you know what was happening there, folks? God took the idol out of my life, out of the way, so I could clearly see and listen. And it was during that time that I started thinking about the conversations with Nathan. And it was during that time that I says, right, do you know what? I was a full-time footballer. I'm injured. I have all the time in the world to think. Now, folks, I hate it reading. I hate it studying. I, school, I had no interest. But you know what? My mind went into overdrive because the Lord was dealing with me. I wanted answers. So I decided to start going as me, right, I'm going to go down the sand street. What does sand say about God? And then as I started looking into different things, I couldn't believe what I found. I found world-renowned scientists who teach in the top universities who have serious credentials, serious titles above their name, who don't believe in evolution, who don't believe in Big Bang, who actually laugh at it. They say it's not science, it's a philosophy. I remember arguing with Nathan McConnell in the Clivenville changing room saying, evolution's real, Nathan. The Big Bang's real. I remember thinking one day, Connor, you haven't even read two lines into the Big Bang for evolution. And you're sitting here arguing with a Christian that it's all real. Folks, don't think that you're not affected by your environment. See magazines, see media, all these things, they do go in and you do form an opinion without ever really looking into it. You can ask many people, why do you believe it? Oh, I just believe it. Listen, why do you believe it? I just always believed it. Some people don't even know why they believe what they believe. So I was one of those people. One of those people. Now, I started looking into these things and started to see evidence that these scientists were given why they, did, they, why they believe there's definitely a creator and believe it or not, these people weren't Christian. Things like you move the sun 1%, we can't survive. You move the moon 1%, we can't survive. DNA, it's, it's information. It's, you need intellect to read it. You can read DNA. It's intelligence. You look at the human body, you look at, the, you look at your eyeball, it's a design. Even a mustard seed itself. It's got little sensors in it that actually checks its soil temperature, checks oxygen pressure, checks these things, and it says, no, it's not time to grow. Man can't even come close to creating anything like that or making anything like that. So that is, there's, you look at the seasons, you look at photosynthesis, you look at water cycles. It's order, precision, design, and intelligence. It's all there. A design demands a designer. It's the only logical answer there is. So I started seriously, now there was a lot more than that that I'm cutting through a lot of years here. I started to believe there's definitely a God. There's definitely a creator. Everything logically points towards that. So I wanted to look into different religions, see who was right. So I started looking into, I even still got the Quran downloaded on my phone. I started looking into Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witness believe, the Hindus, Buddha, uh, Buddhists, even Taoism. There were many things I was just digging in and out of. And you know what, folks? I know when I was looking, I wasn't just looking from here. Because see if you're trying to find God up here, if you're trying to determine truth from here, you'll go around in circles. Because an, an, a very intelligent man can convince you to believe something one day, then the next day can convince you the other. But when I was looking into these different kinds of beliefs and reading into them, my mum used to come in and see me on Google and go, are you all right, son? She says, I wish you'd have put this into your school. I wanted answers. And you know what? I wasn't searching from just here. I was searching from here and here. 
Because that is what the God of the Bible, he deals with the heart first. So I'll give you a question for your heart. Is it wrong to murder? You instinctively say yes. Why? Because I don't want to be murdered. Is it wrong to lie? Yes. Because I don't want anyone to lie against me. There are questions for your conscience. You don't need to be a politician about those and go around in circles. That's truth. Truth is something when it hits, you can't say it, stop it. So truth is real. You're in front of me here right now. That is a truth fact. You can't get around that. So when I was searching, I knew, when I read things in the, like the Quran, the things that Muhammad done, many evil things. And you know what? I knew from here, this is not the way to the divine. It can't be. My heart would not let me believe it. And then other religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, what's Hinduism? Millions of gods still counting. They have a place where they let children because of the Hindu beliefs starve and die for no food, but the cows live and get fed because they're sacred. Folks, what does your heart tell you? What does your conscience tell you? That's not godly. I'm not saying that with a hard heart. I'm saying that with a sad heart. The people actually follow and believe that. So I came to see that I couldn't believe a lot of these things I was looking into. But here I remember, remember that I remember getting the thought, remember that Bible Nathan McConnell gave me? I wonder if it's still on the top of that wardrobe. Of course it was there. God is good. And I went and I took it and I remember reading it for the first time. And I had read these gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as a Catholic boy growing up. Had to pass school exams, right? Obviously on the gospel, on the gospels. But I had never read it this way. And you know what? When I was reading it, I know now God was definitely revealing himself to me. Why was God revealing this word to me? This is going to be a challenge for you here tonight. Because I didn't want to read this book just to get knowledge. I wanted to know God. Yes, God was the one working that in me. The Father was drawing me to his Son. But I'll tell you what, I was reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and started to laugh. And as, as if I'd never read it before. My wife Shannon came in from work that night and I remember going to her, Shannon, can you really read this? And she looked at it and went, obviously it kind of bursted my bubble. She went, what am I meant to be getting here, Connor? I said, you're not getting anything from that. And that obviously, so I went right okay. But I continued to read. I went through the whole New Testament in no time. And I started to see things that I was brought up in my Catholic beliefs that Jesus taught against. I was thinking, but I thought the Catholic Church claimed to be the Christian way. But what Jesus teaches here is so against it. So at the side of that, I remember going, right, Connor, there's, there's an Old Testament in this book. You can't get fully taken away with this right now. So I went down to a shop in the town, and I tried to find a, ba- I heard about a Bible shop. I went into a wrong shop. I went into a Catholic Bible shop, and I knew when I went into it, I went... I said to the wee woman, um, do you have Bibles? She says, yes, and I, and I looked around and said to me, love, I think I'm in the wrong shop. And I actually walked out. And I remember, I just walked down, I was in Castle Street and I walked down and just, and I seen it. I mean, that's the way, it was a faith mission. So I went in and got myself an old New Testament study Bible. And I just ate that. But see what I'm going to say to you folks here tonight, that When I was reading the Bible, I was seeing things in the Old Testament, prophecies, so many of them, about one man. And you knew it was Jesus. It was clear. I hadn't even had a knowledge of the Bible. I knew who it was talking about. 
Even the, even the little teaching that I'd taken in maybe as a Catholic boy, I knew this is Jesus. See, when you go to the Quran, you go to these other religious texts, they don't boast any weight even close to that. Hundreds of prophecies about one man. The tree we'd be born in. Right? Things that would happen in his life. Harry would die in very detailed that they would call him, that they'd come to his own and they would not receive him, the Jews would reject him. He'd be called the king of the Jews. And what a Pilate put on the cross, the king of the Jews. How can a man have all these people write these things down who are the Jews? Way before he's born, exactly detailed how he would die. And the very people who wrote it down was the very people who rejected him. That is serious. Now, that isn't what was making me believe in Jesus yet. But it was seriously pointing me towards him. I got to the New Testament and decided to go really into it more and more. And you know what started to happen? I started to fall in love with this man. Because this man... Was perf- this man is perfect love. When you see the things that he did, it was constantly love, peace, compassion, grace, mercy, truth. And there's, you even see where he fed the hungry, he healed the sick, he healed the blind, he healed the deaf, and he raised people from the dead. See, when Jesus did those things, right, folks, there's a little teaching in that for us. Jesus fed the hungry because mankind is starved of the word of God. Jesus healed the deaf because mankind is deaf to God. He healed the blind because man is totally blind to God. He healed the sick because man is sick with sin. He raised people from the dead. Why? Because man is dead spiritually and he's risen from the dead. He was nothing but a perfect picture of love. Now, I started to really believe why this man is God. Why? Because of his character. Remember the heart thing again? Because my heart could totally connect. And, and everything that he said, yes, it made logical sense here, but I was getting hit hard here. And I couldn't stop thinking about Jesus. But this, the, why did he come? It was to deal with the sin problem, to do his Father's will. That's why he came. Yes, he'd done all those wonderful things, all those healings and fed the hungry and all these things, Yep, and he didn't want people just to believe he was God because he said he was God. Because what he said showed action. Showed action. Because that's what true love is. It's the Greek word called agape, which means love that shows action. It means you have the other's best interest at heart. And that's what Christ was a perfect example of. But there was one thing Right? That was going to be greater than all that. And that was what he was going to do. He was coming always to die on a cross. And what does that mean? The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. That's not just death of the body. That's hell, the judgment of God forever and the wrath of God. That's where sin leads to. Now, we have a serious problem because we're all, mankind is all sinners. God says the wages of sin is death. But thank God it doesn't end there. 
Because he says, the gift of God. What is a gift? It's free. You receive it. You don't pay for it. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So here, and I'm going to explain the gift. It's him and what he'd done for you and me. He went to a cross and he shed his blood on the death. He said, might say, Connor, what does that mean? It simply means that he went there to pay for the sins of all mankind. You might say, Connor, well, well, well many people were crucified. Why could, what's the difference with this man? Because this man is God. It's the infinite worth of the one that went there. And we only know deep down that God is the only one that could pay for all our sin. The creator himself. So when he went to that cross, he was on it six hours. The second three hours he was on it, the wrath of God was poured out upon the Son of God, Jesus Christ. His own Father crushed him. What does that mean? He went into that judgment as you, you and my representative. He could represent me and you because he's God. He's big enough. He went in there to take what we deserved. Our sin deserves hell. We were totally hopeless, dead in trespasses and sins. But God had compassion because God is love. He came down to this pit of sin, took upon flesh, and had one thing in his mind was to go and die for you and me. To take hell on a cross. Take the wrath, the anger of God that we deserve. And you know what? If you trust and believe that with all your heart, soul, and mind, your sin will be forgiven. But then it doesn't finish there. Because if it finished there, a dead man could save no one. No one. Three days later, he rose from the dead. Hallelujah. Yeah. And you know what that means, folks? It means hope. Yeah. Victory. It proves that everything that he took for you and me on that cross, the hell that he took, the wrath of God, was accepted by God. Why? Because he rose back to life. He rose from the dead. And that is the guarantee that if you believe the Lord Jesus Christ died in your place, your sin will be forgiven. But if you believe he rose, but you have to also believe that he rose from the dead for you. And that is what will grant you eternal life. You can't separate them. It's the full gospel. Christ died, was buried, and risen. And you know what will happen if you trust and believe that with all your heart, soul, and mind? You'll live it. And that is the proof. That is the miracle. That is the greatest miracle that has ever been done. Did you know the Lord saving a soul? If you're tonight, the Lord saves your soul. It is greater than him even doing the whole creation. It's a greater miracle. Redemption is even a greater miracle. Because God spoke everything into existence. Spoke it with his, his mouth. But to save mankind, he had to humble himself, come right down in the form of a man. It took action. God had to do more, a lot more. So if you trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross, right for you, his death becomes your death. If you believe that the Lord went to the grave and rose three days later for you, 
His burial becomes your burial and his resurrection becomes your resurrection. And you know what? He lives in the power of an endless life. So his life will become your life. That is what the hope of the gospel is. Death causes fear. But the fear is not just the grave. Folks, your soul knows when it's not right with God. Because there's something worse than the grave. It's called the wrath of God for all eternity. So see this fear you have when someone gets a fear of they know they're going to maybe die of cancer next week and they're not right with God. God allows that fear to be there as a grace. Because what does fear do? You try to get something done about it. Like, I will, if my boy plays by the roadside and he's going to get knocked down, well, he get, well he get, at a risk of getting knocked down, you better believe I'm going to go and instill a healthy fear in him. I'm going to say, son, I better not have to tell you to go down that road again. And I'm going to punish you because I don't want you to die. I love you. God allows that fear to be within us. Why? To make us run to the one who can take it away. So if you're here tonight and you're not saved, I know if you knew you were going to face death tomorrow, you'd be crippled with fear because your soul knows it is not right with the Lord of glory. That is what the resurrection is about. That resurrection power. That you can be risen with Christ. Christ. Right here, right now. And it goes right out in the eternity. That's when the Christians get saved. That God, the can't through his word, wants them to live in the good of. Folks, believe in Christ just died will never save you. Never save you. It's believing and trusting that Christ died, was buried and rose for you. That's the gospel. But there's something else that needs to take place before that gospel can do anything for you. And it's called repentance. Repentance is simply this, that you are agreeing with God that you're a sinner and that you need him to change you. He's the only one that can turn you away from sin. You can't do it on your own. Look how we feel. There's evidence that we just feel. Trying to clean up our own sin doesn't work. We need a divine intervention. So this is repentance. It's like an alcoholic has to admit they're an alcoholic before they can be rehabilitated. They've got to be honest. They've got to be truthful. They've got to be real. If you're here tonight, folks, and you know not Christ as your Savior, you need to get honest and real and truthful with Christ. You need to admit you're a sinner. And only then, when you trust in the gospel, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, can the rehabilitation process begin. So, that's repentance, and that is the gospel. And I trusted the Lord seven and a half years ago. Don't know the exact date. I repented many times to make sure it was real. And I'm going to tell you now, he saved my soul. Now, if there's anything, I'm going to just touch on this little scripture. It won't be too long, and then we'll close. But if there's anything said here tonight, the most important thing you can leave here tonight if you know not Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is that God, repentance and gospel that I just explained there. And if you have any problem understanding it, listen, stay behind after and it will be clearly explained to you. Clearly explained to you. So I'm going to finish this bit of scripture. And you'll probably hear the gospel again because we can't say it enough. Right? And it's just very quick. It's in Matthew 7, it's verse 21 through 23. And the reason I'm going to touch on this scripture, 
because it had a lot of relevance to me growing up, thinking that the, obviously that the Catholic way was the way to God. So this scripture really hit me. But I think it's a scripture that even as Christians, we can't hear, we can't hear it enough. And I'm just going to read it first, and then I'm just going to give a quick explanation, and then we'll close. Okay? So Matthew 7, verse 21. I'm going to read through verse 23. Now, this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, and this is people who face him at the judgment. All right? Now, I'm reading this so you can maybe see where you come in these lines. Right? Where do you stand? Right? Because this is now the, a big challenge to all our hearts. Not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that practice lawlessness, or you who practice sin. That's what it would be. Folks, this is a serious piece of scripture. These are people facing Jesus at their end and they're calling him Lord. You don't call anybody Lord unless you believe he's your Lord. So these people are saying, Lord, Lord, I see where it says Lord, Lord twice. When you look at the original Greek language, do you know what they're actually saying? They're begging. They're crying. It's like, Lord, please, Lord, Lord, Lord. Crying out to him. So these people have obviously lived their life thinking, I'm of the Lord. I call him Lord, so he must be my Lord. And the next verse, it gets even more serious. Just, just because you call Christ Lord doesn't mean you enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, what does that day mean? The day of judgment. That means Christ is the judge. Everyone is going to face Christ. Everyone. This is a very serious, serious piece of scripture. Many will say to me on that day, here's it again, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? These people come to face Christ at their end and as all they're doing is Pleading themselves. Pleading themselves. Lord, we did all the Christian things. Lord, we give out tracks. Lord, we did loads of meetings. Lord, we went to church. Lord, I was a good Catholic. Lord, I was a good Protestant. Folks, if you're trusting in that, finished not once did they humble themselves and say Lord as all we have trusted in is your wonderful death burial and resurrection that is what we trust in you nothing of self the Lord hates when we promote self he hates it these people come to face him at their end and that's all they can do is talk about themselves. It's very serious. Because many people follow Christ this way. This way. Then verse 23. And this is the awful words that I hope nobody here has to, has to ever hear. 
And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Do you know what that actually means when you look at the original Greek language? I had no relationship with you. I had no loving relationship with you. Who are you? And then what does he say? Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now here's a challenge for our hearts tonight. If you could look at your life, do you practice self, which is lawlessness by the text, which is sin, or do you practice Christ? Because it's all about him. When a person gets saved, you're saved to be like him. His image and likeness. And a wee quick explanation into why. In the beginning when God created everything, the first two Adam and Eve, why were they there? Why, why were they made? Why was man came made? Why are we here? What's the purpose? The father wanted more like a son. When Christ was in the garden with Adam and Eve, when God was in the garden, that was Christ. He's always the mediator between God and man. And that was always the original plan for man, to be like Christ. Now, sin has stuttered that, but it will never thwart it completely. So Jesus came 2,000 years ago. So people would be saved and be like him. So if you're here tonight and you're saved, you're only here in this life and you're left here to glorify Christ. And I see a part of glorifying Christ, there's a lot of work needs done on us. There's a lot of squeezing process. The Bible says in Acts 14, 22, that we will enter the kingdom through many troubles. And the stress, it means the stresses and tribulations and these things. You think now if you, if, you're, if you get saved, or you think now, believer, if you are saved, look at the many things in our lives that still don't represent Christ. Look at the many things in our thoughts that don't, still, that don't represent Christ. We are always a work in progress, and we must never forget that. But that is the thing why God will allow squeezing processes in life. To teach us something about him. To humble us. Why? Because he's humble. To get off self and think of others. If I have to suffer for this dear brother or sister, well, that's Christ's likeness. Praise God and I rejoice in his name. Because that's what Christ did for us. He didn't moan or groan when he had to take our hell. When people spat on his face, what was his heart? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He's always thinking of the other. He's willing to take all the tribulation, all the wrath of God and more because of love. If you get saved, this is what God demands. A holy life. A faithful and obedient life. A life that it's all about him and nothing about you. Because that's where the true blessing is. That's where your peace will be increased and your love will grow for the Son of God, for the saints, and you'll have a greater burden to reach the lost. Amen. So I'm going to prepare you now for the other side of salvation if you're considering getting saved. The Bible says that if you, des if you desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, there will be persecution. Desiring to draw close to Christ, there is going to be persecution. But the promise, right, of, if you want to say, no persecution, no distress, no trials, eternal bliss, is when we go to glory. 
That's the hope of glory. Hope always means future. We've got the Christian who has the hope of glory in them. And that is with that future glory. When King Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom on earth, and there will be peace. We are saved to work. We are saved to snatch others out of the fire. And this is what this is about tonight. If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ, folks, you reject everything that the Son of God did on the cross. You are saying that all he done is a waste of time for me. If you reject Jesus Christ, the Father will reject you. If you're not saved, the Bible says you're the enemy of God. If you stay unsaved, you will be the enemy of God forever and treat it as the enemy of God forever under his wrath. So we picture it like this when we're saying to you here tonight, you need to be saved and you need to repent and believe the gospel. This is what it's like. You're standing before God as his, as his enemy. But God is holding the wrath back. But he's got this other hand of love out and this hand of love is Jesus Christ. And he's hoping that his enemy takes his hand of love and peace. Because that's why we, we do this, we cry this out. Because we know that the other hand's coming down of wrath. So this is why we, we are crying out to people, be you saved. Because if you reject the hand of love, it's only out for so long. And if you're here now, it's only why you have breath in your body. But if you reject in this life Christ, the hand is gone. And there's only a fearful expectation of wrath. You're treated as God's enemy forever. Because that's what sin, sin is an eternal crime against our maker. There's an eternal punishment for an eternal crime. God, doesn't, God desires none to perish, folks. He wants all to be saved. He is a God of love. His hand of love is out to you through his wonderful, perfect son. If you come to him, eat just one cry of repentance, a whole heart cry of repentance and believe that Jesus died and rose for you and God smack bang saves you instantly. No work, no religion, just love and relationship. That's what it is. God wants a relationship. Just take the way a mother and child sits there and I. A loving relationship, that's to teach us something about what our maker wants with us. A loving relationship. I don't serve God because I fear him. I serve God because I love him. I do this because I love him. And folks, if you want to get to know God and you want to love God more and more and more and be more to Christ more and more and more, he's left us his holy word and he will reveal it to you. See, when you're saved, this word will come alive. It will open up. This has become spiritual food and drink. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's the very word that upholds the whole creation. And you know what? If you get saved and you come to Christ, believers here are commanded to love and care for you. That's what the word says. It's called discipleship. We're to go and make disciples. That's not converts. That's making disciples. That is loving and caring and making sure people are directed to the right ways through the word of God. And if you get saved, you will not be left alone. Because God brings you into a family. That's why he wants Christians to gather together. Because they're going to be the family that gathers for all eternity. So I know thoughts may come into your mind. What if, what if, what if? I'm still doing this, I'm still doing that. I'm living this kind of life. Do you know what? God knows all about it. He just says, come as you are. See whatever needs cleaned up. Trust me, he'll do it because he's done it for me. He's done it for many other people in here. 
And the word says he'll clean it up. He'll, clean, he'll, he'll, he'll help you with all those things. Trust me, all these promises in the word of God will manifest in your life. So I'm going to finish in this, and I'll always finish in the gospel. If you're not saved, this is the most important thing you need to know. You must repent and believe the gospel. Repentance is agreeing with God that you have sinned against him and you need him to change you. Christ is God. And then you must believe with all your heart, soul, and mind that he shed his blood on the death on a cross in your place. As you. That will be your sin dealt with. But then... Three days later, he rose from the dead. And if you trust and believe all that, you will have eternal life. And you will be saved. And the Spirit of God will enter in. And the Word of God will come alive. And you'll really, truly be able to say, Christ lives. He's alive. So please, if you're not saved, Please get saved. Because many people, many people have known this message, have been in meetings like this, and have never got saved. And they're in eternity now, being reminded constantly in hell. And waiting to meet Jesus, the judge, to go into the eternal lake of fire. So please, come to Christ. I don't know any Christian that's ever regretted it. Christian life is not a promise of an easy life it will become more tougher if you really want to live for Christ but you know what it's a kind of tougher life that you praise God for why because you have his peace and you know you're greatly blessed and you know it's only for a short period of time because you know one day I'll be in glory with him see him my saviour face to face so please folks please get saved and if you're here tonight, and maybe you may have heard something even, because I know folks that if you're here tonight and you say you're a Christian, make sure you're a Christian. Make sure. Have I truly trusted that Jesus died and rose for me? Does my life show that I live it? Because that is always the saying. You will live it. A changed life is the miracle. Make sure that you're someone that is known by your life, that you practice Christ and don't practice self. Because if you don't examine yourself, Christians, we always have to examine ourselves in everything. If you don't examine yourself, you're playing a very dangerous game. But thank you very much for listening. <laughs>